My name's Jeff Regan. I'm the lion's eye, his private eye. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, head of the International Detective Bureau. He doesn't care where the money comes from, just so long as it comes to him. He cashes in on trouble, and for him it pays off. For me, it's work. Here's the kind of adventure you've been waiting to hear. Hard-boiled action and mystery with radio's most exciting private detective, Jeff Regan. So stand by for trouble and suspense in tonight's story of The Prodigal Daughter. And now, here's Jack Webb as Jeff Regan. Well, this is the way it started. Melody was sitting in the outer office wearing her horn-rimmed glasses. That told me that the client was in with a lion. I smiled at her, and she blinked back, rolled her eyes toward the lion's den. He's polite today. Yeah, I know. On the phone, I was Jeffrey. No. Yeah? Why do you stand for it? I wish I knew, Melody. Buzz me in, will you? Yes, Melody? Mr. Regan, do you know Mr. Lyon? Oh, well, send him in. Send him in. We're waiting. Good luck. Thanks. Ah, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, my boy. My boy, come in, come in. There's uh, someone here I want you to meet. Now then, Jeffrey... Mr. Carter, this is Mr. Jeffrey Regan, one of my very best men. Jeffrey, this is Mr. Daniel Carter. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Regan? Mr. Lyon has assured me that you're a discreet young man. Well, I always... soul of discreetness, Mr. Carter. The International Detective Bureau is ethically bound to employ sympathetic understanding personnel, as well as alert productive operators. I hope that's true, Mr. Lyon. In my publishing business, I never had the occasion to settle my trust on any one person. Very delicate situation, Jeffrey. Yeah. <clears throat> go ahead, Mr. Carter. Everything said in this room is in the strictest confidence. Well, I want you to know that it wasn't easy for me to come here. It's, uh, it's admitting defeat in a way. Patrice is my daughter. Five years ago, she walked out. Oh, I... I can understand in a way... When her mother died, I started sending her away to schools. I I was no companion for her. Well, have you heard from her at all? Do you know where she is? I've never heard from her, Mr. Regan, since she left. I don't know where she is. But I... I want her back, Mr. Regan. I can see how you feel. International is in business to make people happy. Now, uh, I've offered Mr. Lyon a $2,000 fee if he can find my daughter. 2000 bucks. That figures. <clears throat> now, you can trust International to find your daughter and bring her back. Hmm. Well, then I, I guess that's all, Mr. Regan. I, uh, I'll go now. You'll let me know as soon as you find anything? Of course, of course. Then good day, gentlemen. Trust International, Mr. Carter. Good day. Here's your ticket. You leave on the Sunset Limited at 145 today. I do? You're going to New Orleans to pick up that dame and bring her back. She was 19 when she left home, and any dame who's 19 has a boyfriend next door. I found out that much in two phone calls. The boyfriend hasn't heard from her in over a year. But that means she's got another boyfriend down there. Here's the New Orleans address. You knew all this? And here's the picture of her. She's just been staying away from the old man. This is going to be a nice piece of change. Two grand for bringing her back. Plus expenses. How do you know she'll come back with me? She walked out all alone, that means she wants to be all alone. Maybe we could make another thousand if some nosy newspaper guy just happens to get tipped and wants money to keep quiet. Oh, you're crawling with ethics, aren't you? Melody will give you some travelers, checks. Sympathetic, understanding. Better pack some things before you miss your train. Just in business to make people happy. I want to be happy, too. Beat it. Call me if you run into any trouble. Oh, 
Cotton Boys are here for just one thing. I'll tell you right now. They serve the most delicious oysters in the town. I had to go racing. Two days later in New Orleans at the Roosevelt Hotel, home of the original Ramus Gin Fizz, I figured it would take a lot of fizz to pull away that southern heat, but everybody in the lobby seemed cool enough in linens, tropicals, and seersuckers, except me and a big perspiring man leaning against the CNS ticket counter. He smiled when he saw me and came across the lobby holding out his hand. Well, 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 I'm certainly glad to see you. We thought you'd never get here. Nice trip? It was all right. See, the rest of the boys are headquartered in 810. They're mighty anxious to meet you. They are? Mighty anxious. The uh, Delta cotton growers are going to make it or break it at this convention. Now, I want to... He was talking real sincere and bent over to make a gesture... The accent was phony, but the bulge inside his double-breasted gabardine coat was real enough. It was a 38 automatic. I see. I'll take you up right now. Uh, why don't I meet you up there later, huh? Well, all right, if you'd rather. That's uh, room 810. Now, I'll go out and get a bite and meet you. You do that. About an hour. Clerk. Uh, yes, Mr. Regan? How long have the Delta cotton growers been in town? Uh, Delta Cotton Grows. Uh -huh. Why, they had their convention last May. Last May? Yes, sir. Uh, who's registered in room 810? Oh, well, we have no 810, Mr. Regan. <laughs> That's what I thought. Thanks. <laughs> What do you do with a big man, a phony accent, 38 automatic, and no Delta Cotton Growers Convention? You tell me. Two hours later, in a fresh shirt and a wrinkled suit, I was still working on that one as I climbed the stairs to the Ursuline Street address where Patrice Carter lived. It was one of those dirty, unpainted apartment houses in the French Quarter, full of heat and low-watt light bulbs. The girl who opened the door was tall, black-haired, wore a black dress. The picture Lion had given me of Patrice Carter was a blonde. Yes? My name's Regan. I wonder if I could see Patrice Carter. Huh? Patrice? You're a friend of hers? Yeah, I'm from Los Angeles. How do you do, Mr. Regan? I'm Janice King, Patrice's roommate. Please come in. All right. Right this way. Maybe it was because the two big rooms I followed her through were dimly lit, or maybe it was the sweet, sick smell of flowers. I don't know, but perspiration began to trickle down my back, and I braced myself when Janice King opened another door. Here you are, Mr. Regan. She was young and lovely and blonde, with a burning candle at her head and feet, lying in state, very dead. Patrice Carter. <laughs> I just stood there in that dark room and I looked down at her. I, I think there were other people in the room feeling the same as me and thinking the same thoughts. I must have stayed that way for five minutes. And then I felt Janice King touch my arm. Did you know Patrice very long? No, I didn't know. She asked to have it this way. I know how you must feel... Being a friend, Mr. Regan. Look, Miss King, I didn't know her at all. and I didn't know that she was passed away. I'm a private investigator. I was hired by Daniel Carter to locate his daughter. Daniel Carter? You knew that she had a father. Yes, Mr. Regan, I knew. She told me about him. She told me everything. Oh, you aren't the first one who's been here looking for her. There have been others. Detectives and lawyers trying to get her to go back. Carter knew she was here? If he'd loved her for just one unselfish moment, she'd never have left him. Well, Mr. Regan, she's where he can't bother her anymore. She's where he can't ever see her. Tell him that when you go back. Tell him she's going to be buried tomorrow. Tell him he can stop hiring lawyers and detectives to find her. Why don't you take him a copy of her death certificate? That ought to satisfy him. Now get out! Get out! <laughs> Well, the whole thing had looked too easy right from the beginning. 
I took her advice and I went down to the morgue to get the dope on Patrice Carter's death. There was one white coat there, a little man with a bald head who introduced himself as Oliver Fig. So you're from Los Angeles. So how are things in Los Angeles? What'd you say your name was? Regan, International Detective Bureau. Came here to locate a girl named Patrice Carter. I just came from her apartment. Mm Mm-hmm. And she's dead. Yeah, I know. How? (laughs) Might have wiggled herself to death. Did a dandy strip number at Joe Glorioso's joint. Stripper? Yeah, you got him in Los Angeles, ain't you? Seen that car to dame lots of times. Great! Uh, well, I thought maybe you could give me a copy of the death certificate. I got to take something back with sure, me. Sure, sure. Glad to do it. Oh, she was a real gal. Shame, dirty shame. So how's things in Los Angeles? Uh, let's see. Blanky. <laughs> no, not the same guy. Blackly, blacker. Homicide? They fished him out of the river. Mississippi mud. <laughs> Get it? Got it. <laughs> so, how are things in Los Angeles? Here you are. Carter. Patrice Carter. 731 Earthline. Mm-hmm. Coroner's report referred to Dr. Emmett Swazi. Here you are. Same died three days ago of leukemia. Let me see that. Sure. Leukemia? Then she knew. Sure, you get tipped plenty in advance on leukemia. Any doctor will tell you almost to the day. Nothing else? I mean, was there something fishy about it? Nah, all kosher. So how's things in Los Angeles? Any relatives? None listed. Well, that's it, I guess. Can I have a copy of it? Sure, sure, take that. We got plenty more. Lots of people want death certificates for legal reasons. I once knew a guy who saved them like cigar bands or stamps. One whole wall of his bedroom, papered with nothing but death certificates. Imagine, all homicide. So how's things in Los Angeles? Yeah, this is fine, Oliver. (laughs) See you around. Glad to hear things are better in Los Angeles. wasn't anything more to do after that but go back to the hotel and try to get a reservation out of town. When I asked for my key, the clerk passed me three printed messages telling me that a Mr. Lyon of Los Angeles had been calling. When I got to my room, he called again. Regan, is that you? Where you been? Keep your shirt on. Come on, tell me. Did you see her? Yeah, I saw her. What'd you say? She gonna play ball? How soon are you coming back? She didn't say anything, and we aren't coming back. What do you mean? She's dead. What? D-E-A-D. Dead. She can't do that. It happened three days ago. Leukemia. Now, wait a minute. Old man Carter's paying us $2,000 to bring her back. They're going to bury her tomorrow morning, and they don't want any interference. She was laid out. Her roommate laced me up and down for working for the old man. Name of Janice King. Good-looking brunette. I told Carter we'd bring back his daughter, and we will. There's 2000 bucks in this, and you know how I feel about money. Yeah, I know. So get busy. Now, look. I've done a lot of dirty, rotten things for you, but he's an old man and he's sick and I'm... And he doesn't wear dark glasses because it's a sunny day. He's almost blind. Now, go on over and get that roommate and bring her back. He'd never know the difference. I won't do it. Offer her 500 bucks to come here and pose as Patrice Carter for a week. And she can take a powder. I won't do it. I'm calling Carter first thing in the morning and telling him you found his daughter and that you're on your way back to Los Angeles. I won't do it. Let me take you away from all this. Come on, let's out now, Roger. It was in the French Quarter. They served a thing called a Sazerac and promised a very good floor show at one o'clock. I sat there watching the piano player and feeling kind of sorry for myself. I figured I had more trouble than anybody else, so I had three for Regan. (laughs) It was about then, a tall redhead with a long cigarette holder eased off her stool at the other end of the bar, patted a bald-headed guy on the head and came over my way. She gave me time enough to get a whiff of her perfume and then leaned into me. James? Mm Mm-hmm. Me too. I'm the new headliner. I'm going to dance pretty soon. You ain't antisocial, are you, mister? No, Red. 
I'm just lonesome for home. Where's that? Los Angeles. Hey, that's a good town. And what are you doing here? Work. I'm the new stripper. Oh, yeah, you told me. Mm -hmm. That's a tough racket. Pick them up and put them down, put them on, take them off. Ten years now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How about drink? No, never when I'm working. Later, maybe? Maybe. Are you sure you ain't antisocial? I look all right, don't I? I mean, I ain't slipping. Come here. Hey, you let go. No hard feelings, Red. I just want to see your face. You're crazy or something? Come on, stand still now in the light. What's the matter? Something wrong with me? No, not a thing, not a thing, baby. You're just fine. How long did you say you've been dancing? I've been dancing ten years. Let go. Oh, hold still. That makeup. You wear it all the time. I have to in my business. All right. You had me scared there for a minute. You oughtn't to grab hold of a girl like that. Red, you mind if I ask you a personal question? Well, now, wait a minute. I just met no, you. No, it's about your face. What's the matter with my face? Oh, well, that's beautiful. Oh. <laughs> oh, sugar. That grease paint and makeup, using it heavy like that for a long time, it's hard to get off, huh? Oh, can't ever get all of it off, mister. Mm -hmm. When you've been in the business as long as I have, always going to have some of it on. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, is that what you wanted to ask me? Oh, that's it. Well, you can get more personal than that. You're a little screwy, but I like you. And I like you, Red. Uh, Thanks. Hey, where are you going? What about the drink after my number? Hey. Rain check me, Red. I got things gee, to do. Gee. I had to go back to Janice King's apartment. It was a sticky, sick kind of New Orleans night. From one lighted street, I turned off on Ursuline, a darker, dirtier street. I stopped, right in the middle of the block. All kinds of people have followed me at one time or another, and I've followed all kinds of people. But this had a professional feel to it. Stood there, listening, remembering my automatic and my suitcase back at the hotel. It only took him a second. He was a professional, all right. All I could see was well-pressed gabardine, two arms, and a hand-painted tie. The next thing was a gun butt carefully wrapped in a white linen handkerchief. Settled slowly against the side of my head. One of the well-pressed arms reached over and held me under the shoulders. I yelled at the top of my lungs, but there wasn't any noise. Regan of International was out as cold as a can of beer. Return to Jeff Regan, investigator, in just a moment. An easy way to save for future security is by a payroll deduction for savings bonds. Or if you're not paid on a salary basis, you can purchase savings bonds at your nearest post office, bank, or savings and loan association office. Now is the time to ask your employer to start deducting for savings bonds or to buy a bond on your own. If no other plan is feasible, your bank will deduct enough each month from your savings or checking account to buy a savings bond. For money in the future, buy United States savings bonds. You'll be glad you did. And now, back to the story of the prodigal daughter and Jeff Regan, investigator. I declare you amaze me. When you look at that, oh, isn't that awful? And him all dressed up, Donna? Uh, we won't pay any attention to him, honey. The next thing I knew, a man in a straw hat and a polo shirt was kneeling down beside me, carefully smelling my breath. Easy, easy now, buddy, uh, easy. Mm. You've been making whoopee. Yep, that says rack will do it every time. Ooh. You know, you folks visiting down here ought to be more careful. Get your suit all dirty. <laughs> Hit me on the side of the head. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the side of the head, sometimes the back. No difference at all. Always wind up in the same place, on the street somewhere. Mm. Had enough for the night? Yeah, I think 
plenty. Mm-hmm. I'll take you to your hotel. Huh? That's my cab. I nearly ran over you. Your first trip? Yeah. Well, you know better next time. Oh. Easy oh. now. Did you see my friend? Mm hmm? Big man, gabardine suit. See nobody. Want to look for him? Later. See, what you hunting for? My wallet. Somebody take it? No, nothing's missing. Everything's right here. Mm-hmm. Honest town. Oh, yeah, you're so right. Well, you feel better when you get back to your place. Yeah, sure, sure. It wasn't quite right. I didn't feel better until the next morning when I got a telegram and read, found out Carter's broke. Come back. Forget the whole thing. Lion. And that was the first good news I'd had in three days. Oh, it's you. What are you doing here? She's buried, gone. Yeah, I know. I came back to see you. Wait a minute. You can't come in here. I just did. What do you want now? You. Yes, you. I was hired to come to New Orleans and bring Patrice Carter back to Los Angeles. She's dead and buried, and you know it. That's what you say. That's what a death certificate says. There's only one thing I learned lately. Don't believe what people say. Don't believe what death certificates say. I don't know what you're trying to do, but oh, I... Oh, stop it, will you? I know you're Patrice Carter, and I know the girl who was buried yesterday was the real Janice King. And I know somebody's trying to make a monkey out of you and a monkey out of me. I... Now I listen to me. If, if I have to, I can have that body exhumed. I can go into fingerprints and birthmarks you and a lot of things, but I don't think I'll have to. You see, Patrice Carter wasn't the type to do a striptease for a living. You're just trying to make something out of nothing. I'll call the police and have them arrested. Last night, I ran into the redhead who took her place. She told me what a tough life it is. Ten years of wearing grease paint can be kind of rough on your skin. The dead girl I saw had those kind of marks. The girl I'm looking for couldn't have been in the business that long. Why don't you leave me alone? I... I don't know who talked you into a thing like this, but it's all wrong. He's an old man now. He's broke and lonely and he wants to see you. I don't know what your differences are, but I want to take you back. <laughs> what do you say? He was so off. He hated. I know he did. I never want to see him again. What's he been telling you, honey? Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim, he knows everything. He doesn't know anything. And he'll never know anything. This your boyfriend? He had a phony accent when he tried to shake me down in the hotel lobby. Get out of here, Regan. I played ball and you had to quit trying. It all fits now. This guy's been holding your hand for the last year. He's been real sympathetic at you. Get out before I throw you out. He told you how to trade names with that poor kid who was dying of leukemia. He told you to send me to that morgue for a death certificate. And he dropped me in the gutter last night to make sure I had it. You know why? Don't listen to this character. Baby's off his nut. He's a private detective from Los Angeles who's been getting paid to make love to you. No. No. Regan, I told you to shut up. <laughs> Oh, he was good at the side street work, but this was an apartment. He didn't have enough room to move fast. I let him have the top of my head under his chin for a starter. And then I took a lot of feet in my face, but when he started to cross the carpet pulling for that 38, I saw my chance. She stood there and watched him go down. It's not true. It's not true. You're, you're just here to make more trouble for me. You're just here to make Am I? I thought I recognized the touch. Here. Here's his wallet. Look for yourself. Here, catch. Timothy Conover, private investigation. Well? Oh, come on, kid. I'll take you back home. How was New Orleans? I would... Oh, I didn't know you had someone with you. I'll see you later, Melody. The lion in? Oh, uh, yes, but I wouldn't go in. He's in a bad mood. Uh-huh. What else? Come on, Pat. Regan! So you finally got back, did you? I suppose you've run an expense account that'd choke a horse. Well, let me tell you that it's all coming out of your salary. We didn't make a nickel on that Carter thing, and... Who's this? Patrice Carter. How do you do, Mr. Lyon? 
I thought I told you to leave her down there. Because that old schmo was giving us the runaround and hasn't got a nickel to his name. Besides, she's dead. Yeah, she's dead. That's right. Here's a death certificate to prove it. Now listen to me before you blow the rest of your cylinders. I went to a lot of trouble to bring this girl here. Well, you can send her back where she came from and I'll take her fare out of your salary. On the plane coming back, Mr. Reen explained a great many things to me about myself and about you, Mr. Lyon. Well, I wish you'd explain something to me. When I was a baby, my father placed a trust in a large holding company under my name. $50,000. And I can claim it any time after my 21st birthday. Yeah? How old are you now? Old enough. Mr. Regan found out that much. I made a phone call to Dunn and Bradstreet, know a lot of things. Go on, go on. Nothing more, Mr. Lyon, except I claimed that trust today, and I'll be glad to pay you the $2,000 fee that my father promised you. Well, well, now that's very generous of you, Miss Carter. The International Detective Bureau is proud to have had a small part in bringing you and your estranged father together. I'm not going back to him, Mr. Lyon. I don't want to see him. Now, now, my dear, you're upset. Leave her alone, Lyon. Now, look. I tussled with a private detective named Conover down in New Orleans. He'd been hired by old man Carter to convince Pat that she should switch names with a burlesque girl who was dying of leukemia. Conover does a good job. When the girl dies, Conover wires Carter. Carter comes to you, you call me in and hustle me off to New Orleans, where, according to a perfect setup, I find a phony Patrice Carter dead. I bring back a death certificate, which you turn over to Carter, and then he walks right down and collects that trust fund, which reverts to the original maker only on death. Mm, and him with that story about being old and lonely and wanting only to see his daughter, telling me he'd pay me a $2,000 fee. Why, that dirty crook, he's no better than I am. He tried to make a sucker out of me. He did. You fell for the whole thing. Mm. Trust fund in your name. Well, well, young lady, you can sit right down here at my desk and make out your check. And then I think that as long as you're in town, you might just drop over and see your old father. The International Detective Bureau is in business to make people happy. Uh, and That's no one, all. Uh, you can did everything come out all right? Yeah, I guess so. She's writing a check. That's what he wants. Cigarette? Here. Thank you. Why do you do it, Jeff? Hot in here, isn't it? The air feels good. Makes you clean. He doesn't care whether it's homicide or... Arson or a lost daughter or just people getting kicked around. He makes money on it. I help him. He didn't answer me. Why do you do it? I don't know, Melody. I don't know. Remember, an easy way to save for the future is to buy United States savings bonds. You can buy bonds at your nearest post office, bank, or savings and loan association, or you can ask your employer to start deducting for a bond a month on the payroll savings plan. A bond a month is good security for the years to come. For money in the future, buy United States savings bonds now. You'll be glad you did. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan, investigator, with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon and Lorette Philbrandt as Melody. Tonight's cast included Betty Lou Gerson as Red, Lou Krugman as Conover, Theodore Von Elts as Mr. Daniel Carter, Eve McVeigh as Patrice Carter, and Harry Lang as... How's things in Los Angeles? Remember it's CBS same time next week for hard-boiled action and mystery with radio's most exciting private detective, Jeff Regan as he tells the story of the lonesome lady. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by E. Jack Newman, produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with original music by Del Castillo. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.